This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time a twisted mind, a hole cut in a wire fence, and a corpse in a storeroom. All added up to freedom. But only for the one who had it coming. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Bid for Freedom. When you worry over your bank statement, then hug your office phone from 9 to 5, anxious for business, nothing happens. But the minute you decide you'll get rich another day, chuck the puny balance sheet into a bottom drawer and make plans, you want it. And that was exactly the way it played when at 3 o'clock on the kind of slate gray afternoon that makes the beckoning Santa Fe Railroad vacation billboards look a little more so, I left a note on my office door and headed outside and across the street for some real Hungarian goulash. Very good today, too. A second after a waiter disappeared into the kitchen with my order, she was standing at my elbow. Not quite young, not quite pretty, not quite blonde. And when she spoke, not quite sure of what she was going to say next. You, you're Mr. Philip Marlowe, aren't you? I mean, the private detective whose office is across the street? Yeah, that's right. I, my name is Helen Asher. Oh? No? I have to find someone. You, you do that kind of work, don't you? Finding people, I mean. That all depends, Miss Asher. Who's the person you have to find? Leon Rodell, a friend. Uh-huh. You see, I just got into town. I had his address in my handbag, but I lost it. The handbag, that is. And I don't exactly know which way to well, turn. Well, just a minute, Miss Asher. Let's take it a step at a time, huh? Uh, yeah, now sit down. Oh, and... no. No, thank you. I, I, I'm in a hurry, Mr. Marlowe. Leon Rodell isn't listed in the phone book. I've tried that, and I don't know the name of his firm, his business name. He he deals in ceramics. Is that all you can tell me? Oh, no. I have something else. It's a name and an address here in Los Angeles. Fortunately, that wasn't in my handbag, but here in my coat. No. No, no what, Miss Asher? Outside there, on the street. What's on the street? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I... Hey, me, Miss, Miss Asher. Asher. Wait a minute. There'd been a sort of sad look about Helen Asher that made me want to help her. So after an even sadder look at the plate of goulash that was coming toward me from the kitchen, I followed her to the street. Mr. Marlowe, the goon! When I reached the sidewalk, she was across the street in a cab and away. That might have been the end of it if something small and ugly that had been standing just outside the restaurant hadn't turned and moved into the alley alongside the building. On a hunch that he'd had something to do with the sudden exit of Miss Asher, I followed him and found him standing next to a line of empty ash cans, calmly lighting a cigarette. You always run into alleys to light your cigarettes? Are you always concerned? What do you know about Helen Asher? Helen Asher? I haven't any idea who you're talking about. Come on, little man. I'm talking about the gal who just got into that cab. Do the words begin to flow? Or do I ring them out of here? Get your hands off me. You're ripping my pocket. You're lucky it isn't your nose. Come on, talk. All right, all right. It's no secret. Here, it's all in this letter. Look, right here. Oh! It's over his sharp pointed shoes and caught my shin where it really hurt. By the time I was out of the ash cans. Back on my feet. I knew the damage had been more to my dignity than anything else. I knew also that the little man was gone and I had no idea where. I was halfway out toward the street before I realized that I still had the little man's letter clenched in my hand. It was from an Omaha Life Insurance Company and addressed to one Eldon Hook, 31 Marlboro Drive, Sunnydale, California. Sunnydale wasn't just around the corner, but the fear I'd seen in Helen Asher's face plus a score to settle with... Eldon Hook said the 20-mile drive into the San Fernando Valley was a minor point. Under 
of the gray sky overhead that thickened by the minute. Sunnydale, about the size of the hole in a candied lifesaver, looked as warm and cheerful as crepe paper. And number 31 Marlboro Drive, also gray, was no improvement from the ponderous, bleak stone buildings which said Queen Victoria should have slept there. Past the high, thick wire fence that surrounded it, the wrought iron gate in front of me labeled Hillcrest Sanitarium. Keep out. Took ten minutes of softly phrased questions and answers to get the boss man at Dr. Chinetti to the gate. I told him who I was and what brought me to him, including a description of Eldon Hook. I... I don't understand. Come in, Mr. Marlowe, please. Eldon Hook has been with us as an attendant for more than a year now. and His behavior has always been satisfactory. Uh, nothing would surprise me anymore today. Oh, Helen Asher. Is it possible that she was once a patient here, Doctor? No. Oh. What about Leon Rodell? Leon Rodell? Hmm. How do you know that name? From Helen Asher. She was looking for him. That's why she wanted to hire me. She knew he was here in Los Angeles. Mr. Marlowe, this woman, was she young? About 30, blonde? Yeah, that's right. Why? Why? Because this morning, earlier, about 6 o'clock, one of our patients escaped. A woman you know as Helen Asher, and we know as Charlotte Rodell, Leon Rodell's wife. Oh, she's insane, huh? Temporarily, yes. Come over here, near the fence. Oh. I'll show you how she got away. But how she managed to cut through enough of this thick wire link fence to make a hole large enough to crawl through is beyond me. Here, look, behind this ivy. Uh huh. Even with a good wire snipper, it would take hours to get through all these strands. Huh? Wasn't she missed inside? Yes, but she was only gone minutes. Apparently, she had been doing a little at a time during her recreation period, at night, whenever she could. Uh, be careful of the burrs and those bushes there, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, I see what you mean. Tell me, Doctor, have the police been notified? Of course, at once. The law compels us to. And, frankly, Mr. Marlowe, I'm terribly worried. Oh? You see, it was her husband, Leon Rodell, who had her confined here a year ago. Six months after their marriage, she began to act strangely. He felt it would be only with our help that she could ever regain her mental equilibrium. I thought that we were accomplishing that. Apparently no, huh? Obviously no. <laughs> But, Mr. Marlowe, we must call the Los Angeles police right away and tell them that Leon Rodell now lives here, not in San Francisco. He must be protected. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah, she did break out. She is trying hard to find Leo, and three she ran from Eldon Hook, who was very close on a trail. That's right, Mr. Marlowe. That's why I suggest that Leon Rodell discontinue seeing his wife as of last month. He always left Charlotte very upset. But now I'd better call the police. Yeah, that's a good idea. Although Charlotte didn't know where her husband was staying or what the name of his ceramics business was, she... Say, Doc. Doc, she claimed that she lost a handbag. Have you found it by any chance? Yes, we did. We found it in the brush near the hole in the fence. I've got it right here in my desk. Oh, good. There was an address on the card, Miss. 3840-something. Uh, yes, here it is. 3840 Lookout Terrace. Lookout Terrace. That's right here in the valley, up in the hills, south of Ventura Boulevard. Mr. Marlowe, if possible, I'd like to avoid having the papers get hold of this, this story. This is a rather exclusive nursing home. So? Well, in a sense, you're already in this case. Could you try to find Charlotte Rodell and bring her back here before the police do? Well, Dr. Chinetti, I... It I, would I... be doing a great service for the woman and her husband. I'll pay you your fee. All right, Dr. Chidetti, I'll try. I'll call you as soon as I have something. When I first started from Marlboro Drive in Sunnydale, it had been a combination of interest in a sad-eyed girl and a strong desire to punch Eldon Hook on the nose. Now it was business. It took 20 minutes of fast driving to get over to Lookout Terrace in the hills to separate Hollywood from the San Fernando Valley and 3840 itself. The house was a squat chunk of overly stuccoed, archaic California architecture at the top of a steep driveway. And when I was out of my car and walking toward the front door, everything was black, except tiny pinpoints of light sparkling up from the floor of the valley I just left. Good evening, sir. I hope I didn't startle you, Mr. Rodell. Mr. Rodell? Oh, I know your name. Yes, sir. And I know some other things as well. 
Like what? Oh, incidental facts. Like, uh, well, it's cool in there. So you haven't been home in hours. And? And the refrigerator's empty, so you're only staying here off and on. Also, the old mail inside, phone bills, etc. They don't have your name or this address. So this is probably a friend's house. Which totals to what? To zero, maybe. Zero, Mr. Rodell, like you're going to total if you don't pay the money you owe to my good friend in San Francisco. Yeah, you know who I mean, don't you, Mr. Rodell? Yeah, yeah. What I don't know is how good friend thinks I'm going to raise that kind of dough. <laughs> I made it funny? Oh, you're kidding. Uh, What's 15000 to you? You, uh, shall I say, an intimate friend of Ordeen Blackburn? Oh, uh, Ordeen Blackburn. Yeah, Ordeen Blackburn. Come off it, boy. I'm thorough. An eager sort. I know that the lady from Bel Air is loaded and that she's nuts about you. No fooling. Now, before I leave, a word of advice, Rodell. One can't run away from his obligations forever. And you won't be able to walk away after 24 hours. Unless, of course, you pay. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Eager. Till we meet again. <coughs> oh. There'll be some heat in here somewhere. Information. Oh, operator, I'd like the telephone number of a Miss Ordeen Blackburn in Bel Air. I don't have the address. Have you tried your directory, sir? Yeah, no, I can't. The house burned down. One moment, please. Yeah. <laughs> we have an Ordeen Blackbird at 2321 Bell Air Road. Yeah, that's it. What's the number, please? Nevins, 31121. 31121. Thank you. House burned down. <laughs> Hello, Miss Blackburn. Yes, this is she. Miss Blackburn, my name is Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective who at the moment is anxious to get hold of Leon Rodell. you know where he is? We, yes, I do, but I don't think... Now, please, it's important. Leon Rodell's life is in danger. I want to help him. Leon's life? What's going on, Mr. Marlowe? Well, there isn't time to explain, believe me. That's what she said, but Who I... said? Someone who called about 20 minutes ago. A Miss Helen Asher. Oh? She said she was supposed to meet Leon at his storeroom about purchasing some ceramics. But she forgot his address there. Did you give it to her? Oh, well, yes, I did. Oh, great. She's the one who's after him. What's that address? Come on, quick. 3909 and a half Ventura Boulevard. Sure. It's in the rear of a parking lot. But tell me, Mr. Marlowe, what's well, wrong? Well, there's plenty wrong. For one thing, I... Talk to you again, baby, some other time. I doubt it, Mr. Rodell. Jumped to a hasty conclusion, didn't I? Uh, yeah, yeah, you did, Eager. You see, I'm really only a bill collector, just like yourself. So why don't we... Just uh... make up... Uh... <laughs> Not a chance, sweetheart. I wouldn't be happy that way. I wouldn't know when you were telling the truth. And when you were lying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> now, as I said before, good night. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, CBS will bring you the earth-shaking premiere of a new opera tomorrow night. An opera written by Alec Templeton with Charlie McCarthy as a lovelorn singing Bengal Lancer. Templeton himself as a Maharaja and Ursel Twing as a flying carpet salesman. You can hear it on the CBS Charlie McCarthy Edgar Bergen show tomorrow night. And don't forget, Red Skelton, Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, Horace Hyde, and all the other CBS Sunday night stars will also be on hand on most of these same CBS stations. Jack Benny, of course, has heard of them all on Sundays. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Bid for Freedom. Gun butt I'd been slapped with felt like a log chain. Next time would be different. I waited till Eager drove away and then went out and got in my car and unwound my way down the hill again to Ventura Boulevard. There I turned west and drove out to 3909 and a half. There was a glass and neon super grocery store closed for the night. 
The only light showing at Leon Rodell's ceramic outfit trickled out on the ground in a narrow wedge to what had to be a partly open back door. And even as I watched it, the wedge danced into a crazy pattern and disappeared. I ran for it and got there just in time to see Charlotte Rodell dart down the alley. A second later, she vanished in the shadowy jumble of backyard buildings. I knew there was no use trying to follow her. Instead, I eased the storeroom door open and looked in at a room full of flower pots, lamp bases, and dishes. Nothing moved. Charlotte, I was sure, had had a reason for running, so I went in toward a table in the corner where the only light was burning. I was almost up to it before I saw the reason. Yeah, it was a good one. Eldon Hook, the sanitarium attendant, was on the floor behind the table, his body still trying to arch away from the knife in his back. When I bent over him, he opened his eyes. They were already cloudy. I, I was close. I found the hole in the fence, and I knew Ordine was... Ordine what, Hook? Who did it? Can you tell me? I never figured on... I left Eldon Hook just as he was. Went to the door that opened to the front of the ceramic shop. A desk was there with a phone on it. I got halfway through the homicide bureau number when a silhouette showed up at the curtains at the front door. I put the phone down, stepped back into the shadows and waited. Well, that's funny. Must have left the work light on. Not necessarily, Mr. Rodell. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective. You are Leon Rodell, aren't you? Yes. What are you doing here in my shop? You better finish taking your overcoat off, Mr. Rodell. Now, see... Your yes. wife has run away from Hillcrest Sanitarium. My... Charlotte is out? That's right. How do you know this? She came to me tonight under a phony name. Tried to get me to locate you. She'd lost your address. Oh. This is a shock, Mr. Marlowe. A terrible shock. Poor Charlotte. What an awful thing this is for her. Yeah. Excuse me, I... I need this. Sure. Oh, you? No, thanks. Yeah. You see, Marlo, I've only been here in Los Angeles a month. And the last time I visited Charlotte, that was about three weeks ago, and I hadn't planned to stay out. Wait a minute. My wife is the only one who had my local address. If she lost that, how did you find me? Now, that's a long story. I got the address Charlotte lost, and I've already been up to your house, but the last step was a call to a Miss Ordine Blackburn. Ordine? Yeah, she sent me up here. Oh, then you know about Ordine and me. A little. Well, I suppose under the circumstances, that's hard for you to understand, Marlo, and even harder to accept. Not exactly, under the circumstances. Oh, well, the law is not as generous as you are. Has no room for understanding. Insanity isn't grounds for divorce until after three long years have passed. And I maybe Miss Blackburn doesn't want to wait that long, huh? Well, to be frank, I don't know. I'm in love with her. I think she loves me. I haven't had the courage to tell her about Charlotte yet. Maybe you won't have to. Hmm? Charlotte called her up tonight before I did as a Miss Asher. She must have gotten Ordine's name and phone number from you some way on that last visit of yours. No, no, that's impossible. Well, she got it some way. Marlo, do you know where Charlotte is? We've got to find her. She's not responsible. She might even be dangerous. It's an understatement, Rodell. She's deadly. Deadly? Hmm. I, I don't understand. Come here. Over behind that table there where the light is. What? Go ahead and look. Well, what's over there? When I showed up here tonight, I saw Charlotte running away. I came in and found that. Oh, my God. The attendant at the sanitarium. Yeah. He knew she'd escaped. He found the hole in the fence where she got out, and he's been following her on his own, strangely enough. He's dead. Marlowe, he's dead. Hook, he's, he's dead. Rodell! Sorry. Mar Marlowe, she must be completely mad. We've got to stop her. Why, she might go for Ordine next door. Or you, what? yeah. What can we do? Well, you can go home. She doesn't know that address up there, so you'll be okay on that score. All right, but... Uh... Rodell, listen. Keep your doors locked up there, will you? Well, you sure. You said Charlotte... I know, I know. I'm not thinking about Charlotte now. There's something else. The guy in San Francisco that you owe all that money to. What about him? Sent a mug down here who intends to collect it. I've tangled with him already. He means business. So be careful, Rodell, and I'll see you as soon as I can. Watched him go out the door limply, his head down. He looked about as tough as a bowl of whipped cream. And I went back to the desk again and saw that he'd left his overcoat where he dropped it on the chair. 
I called the police, gave them the word on Charlotte, and when that was over, I had to switch on the desk light to check the sanitarium number before I could call Dr. Chinetti. That's when I saw the letter lying on the desk, an important letter. But for one reason only. It was addressed to Leon Rodell at his house on Lookout Terrace. It was an open invitation to anybody who'd come to the shop looking for that particular piece of information. And there was no doubt in my mind that Charlotte had seen it, which made it long past time for me to get up there and on the double. I turned, headed for the door, and stopped all in one motion. As a pair of headlights slashed at the windows and then blinked out. I stepped back out of the circle of light from the desk lamp and waited. A second later, the hulk of Mr. Eager filled the open back door. He was still very sure of himself. He took in the storeroom with one long glance and then sidled through the clutter as deftly as a rumba dancer toward the door where the desk and I were waiting. The instant he got within reach, I swung! You again, you dirty lousy... Major no. pitch once, big man. Why don't you sit on it? Why, you pig... That's where it's of that clip on the chops you gave me. Oh, oh no. No, not quite, Mr. <laughs> Even Stephen now, big man. When he went down that time, he took the chair, Rodell's overcoat, and half the stuff on the desk with him. He was still moving, trying to free himself of the tangle, so I reached for him again, but got only a fistful of the overcoat Rodell had left behind. And suddenly, my hand stung like I'd grabbed the wrong end of a bumblebee. I jerked it back and looked at the palm. Something was stuck to my skin, something I couldn't understand. Until finally, realization oozed through the molasses in my brain. I left and ran all the way to my car and almost sprung the frame, twisting up Lookout Terrace. <laughs> hill from 3840 and ran as far as the house next door where I got to the back, hopped the fence and got my gun in hand. As I expected, Leon Rodell was there and so was Charlotte in the coop. The door open was poised at the top of the precipitous driveway like the lead car on a roller coaster. Why are you angry with I'm me, I'm not angry, on? Charlotte. Now get in the car. We haven't much time. Oh, I did everything just like you said, Leon. I, I know. I lost my hand the over car, your address and I had, the car, Charlotte, I had yes. to find you, didn't I? You did fine. I did everything. And then I learned about your shop, and I went there. Well, you shouldn't have done that, Leon. Charlotte. I'll get in the car. Leon, I saw what you'd done to that Mr. Hook the from the car, sanitarium. The rushed. You killed him with a knife. I had to, Charlotte. He'd been spying on us all oh. the time. He knew all our plans, and yeah. he wanted lots of money to keep quiet. It the frightens car, me, Leon. I wish you had. Stop it, Charlotte. It doesn't matter oh, anymore. It doesn't don't matter. kid yourself, oh. Rodell. Mr. Marlowe. Oh, I, I found Leon by myself, so I, I really don't need you after all. I only wish you were right, baby. Don't yes. move, Rodell. Oh, but you don't understand, Mr. Marlowe. Leon and I are going away together on I a trip. I understand, all right, more than you do now, Charlotte, and I think you better go in the house and wait for oh, us. No, huh? no, don't please, you see? Please, please, we... do as I ask. All right. But don't be long. Some trip you had in mind, Rodell. Your wife in this coop and straight down over the bank, strictly solo. She didn't even suspect. Uh, you keep your hands off me. Sure, sure. I'd never get them clean again. But it'll give me great satisfaction to drop you with a bullet. And I'll do just that if you take one step before the police get here. So stand still, Rodell. Real still. <laughs> glad I'm back. So am I, my dear. And we'll talk more about it in the morning. What you need right now is a good night's rest in your own bed. Oh, you're right, Doctor. I'm very tired. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. And thank you. Good night, Shirley. Hmm. She still doesn't realize, does she? No, and it's a good thing. But plenty of time for that later when it can come gradually. At this point, she could tear herself to pieces over a thing like this. Yeah. A husband who urges her to run away and helps her do it for the sole purpose of getting her out where he can kill her. Not much security in that setup, huh? No. You mentioned another woman, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, Miss Ordine Blackburn? Oh, Ordine, yeah. Gullible rich girl without much on the ball. Rodell planned to marry her and solve all his money problems. Yeah. Oh. Believe me, Doc, he had them big ones. I see. 
Well, she's better off this way. Yeah. Six months of marriage to Rodell, and she'd have been a candidate for your sanitarium herself. He's that kind of a guy. And my late employee, Eldon Hook? Well, he knew that Rodell had been urging his wife to run away and that he'd cut that hole in the fence. Hook mm. found out that Rodell was interested in Ordeen, and he tried to shake Rodell down. He signed his own death warrant on the spot. You know, it's sometimes frightening to me, Mr. Marlowe, to realize how many warped and twisted minds there are that never get help until it's far too late. Mm. But there's always some good in every bad thing, they say. What about this case? Charlotte. I expect her to recover completely soon, because now the main contributor to her neurosis, so to speak, is gone forever. Oh. That was Leon Rodell. Yeah, well, Doc, it's a long way back to Hollywood. I better get going, huh? Just one thing more, if you don't mind. Hmm? Charlotte would have died in a smashed car in what would have passed for an accident. Also, she'd have been blamed for Hook's murder if you hadn't found out the truth about Rodell. I'm very curious. You remember the burrs that grew along your fence outside? The burrs? A blasted nuisance. Yeah, but as you just said, Doc, there's always some good in every bad thing. Rodell told me that he hadn't been up here for three weeks. And yet tonight his overcoat was loaded with burrs. I got one in my hand from it. Oh. That gave me a hunch. <laughs> well, from there on it played. Disappointed? To the contrary. Satisfied completely. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. Good night, Doc. <laughs> As I left Hillcrest Sanitarium and drove back across the wide, flat San Fernando Valley, dark and quiet in the hour just before dawn, I found myself being grateful for a lot of little, orderly things. Things like the clear white line down the middle of the road, the rhythm of the motor in my car and the prospect of going home, and my own secure apartment. And then I wondered about Charlotte and the sort of nightmare jungle the world must be to a mind twisted suddenly, out of focus, where there is no symmetry or logic. But nightmares can be banished, huh? Fears driven away. And in time, with Dr. Cinetti's help, she'd come out of it all right. But the others, others like Hook and Rodell, to them the jungle is home. No nightmare that. They live in it by choice. Until one way or another, they're destroyed. Choked to death by the very tangle they hide in. Well, that's fair enough. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Leffitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Larry Dobkin, Yvonne Patey, Harold Deerenforth, Jack Edwards, and John T. Smith. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a fireball, too handy with a target pistol, led me down a rocky road past a sleazy money grubber to a curly-headed corpse. And it might have gotten worse if I hadn't slowed down at the hairpin turn. Battered but unbowed by his bout with Fred Allen last Sunday night, Jack Benny will be back at the same old stand tomorrow night, jaunty as ever, and why not? Jack has just been elected the King of Hearts by the American Heart Association. Listen for Jack Benny tomorrow on CBS. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Philip Marlowe takes the case every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.